And we're going to move on with our next panel because what we're going to do now is discuss how we integrate health research and innovation. And we're going to use pediatric cancer as a test case within this. I've got an esteemed panel with me. We have Ruth Lydia Ladenstein, Gilles Vassal, Annette Bakker, Saladin Chibu, and Pablo Iharo Massi. And they're going to introduce themselves in a few seconds and also give us a sense of what their views are at this point in time, and also looking to the future. Uh, Ruth, if I could uh, ask you first of all. Well, thank you very much. Um, we are supposed to introduce ourselves. So I'm a pediatric oncologist at the Children's Cancer Research Institute in Vienna in Austria, Sire of Europe board member, coordinator here in Petken, and currently uh, on mission in the Cancer Mission Board. And uh, as such, uh, I think uh, it comes from my heart to say uh, that children and um, cancers in adolescents and uh, young adults really need uh, to have uh, better cures and we need to cure. So for those uh, not, not probably knowing, cancer is a leading cause of death for children in uh, Europe about one year of age. And uh, cancer comes as unique uh, and multiple types of uh, rare cancer and have very specific biological and clinical features and most importantly, uh, excuse me to be blunt, uh, children are not just small adults, and that's why they need a really dedicated and devoted research in, uh, for their specific needs, uh, and one of them is drug development, but there's many more. Um, we boost or have the opportunity of a boost of really transformational change, I think, by through public-private partnerships. And uh, we need to foster co-design, co-creation, and embark into a common digital future, integrating European uh, healthcare systems um, with research and innovations. We need enabling technologies uh, to embark into a new and I think exciting future, all with uh, patient centricity and with the focus uh, to really uh, work together on uh, the complex complex needs of children and young people with uh, cancer. Um, Long-term care should not be forgotten, and I think we have uh, exciting means and tools to really uh, serve a whole cancer continuum from first diagnosis to adulthood. Thank you very much. Ruth, Ruth thank you very much indeed. Uh, Gilles, can I come to you next, please? Yes, yeah, thank you, Maxine. Good morning, everyone. So I am Gilles Vassal, a pediatric oncologist from Gustave Roussy in Villejuif in France. I'm a CIP board member. I'm chairing the Accelerate International Platform, as well as the ITCC Network, which is running uh, innovation for children across Europe. As a start, I would say that uh, it's really the moment of accelerating innovation. And the way forward is really to work together, industry, academia, regulators and parents. And we start to show that it is of value. And within this, this framework, public-private partnership and the initiative by IMI2 is extremely important. We started to show the value of this through a program called ITCCP4, building a preclinical platform for deciding which drug to move forward in pediatric cancer. And I would like very much in this discussion to share with you some of the important topic that could be addressed by IMI2 in the new partnership, integrating with other programs as discussed previously, and really making all the people, including HTA, around the table. Thank you, Maxi. Gilles, thank you very much. Annette. Good morning. I'm Annette Bakker. I'm the president of the Children's Tumor Foundation in the US, and I'm also the vice chair of the recently launched CQF Europe. And our Focus is on the investment in discovery, and then we have built an integrated system to make sure that every discovery that can trans be translated into clinical benefit will be translated into clinical benefit, and that for a disease called neurofibromatosis. Um, I'm very excited about that idea of the integrated healthcare system, because I think what I would love in my life 
to see happen is that we somehow redesign the patient journey. And that would be to achieve three things. First of all, to um, shorten the path to diagnosis and treatment, to improve the predictability and the quality of the patient journey, and the third one, to really make sure that people have access to quality care. And the reason why I think that we really need an integrated healthcare system to do so is that when we speak to our patients and families, we are able today to give some kind of siloed answer, a siloed answer about diagnosis, about data, about treatment, about drugs, about devices. And I think to have this integrated healthcare system will really allow us to give these people holistic answers instead of these siloed answers. And I agree completely with Rob that children are not small adults. I'm very much in favor of that statement. So thank you. Annette, thank you very much indeed. Saladin, can we hear from you? Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm Saladin Shibut from Novartis. I'm very excited to be here today to discuss about the next uh, public private partnership. I'm the chair of the um, RIS, Research Innovation and Strategic Group at FPR, and a member of the IMI board. Actually, I'm a member of the IMI board for the last 10 years, so I have seen the evolution of the partnership you know, in Europe. And uh, I'm so excited about where we are today and where we are coming from. Uh, just as a reminder, I mean, just from the industry perspective, we were not used to talk to each other. We were not used to collaborate. And we have learned a lot. And thanks to IMI, it has really pushed us to, uh, to a different way of thinking. And uh, it's kind of uh, normal now that we speak about IMI and having industry joining with academics and working. But I can tell you this was a long way and uh, it's really exciting. And this is not the end. It's just there's too much that we can do. The next wave for us in the next PPP, the next public private partnership, is to engage with other industries than pharma. And we have been, we have started to work with uh, non-pharma industries, and some of them are, are being mentioned, and we can talk about that later, but we have been working for the last two years to prepare for the next PPP. It's not something that we are just starting to work on now. It's two years of, um, of making, and I can tell you, it's so exciting how, how, to see how much we are aligned with the industry. So industry in Europe is ready. I can tell you, we have defined our strategic agenda and uh, we have defined how we can work together. It's clear, we, are, we, are, we know that we need to work together. And the COVID situation now has just magnified the problem of, uh, that we were, we were confronted in the past, that everyone was thinking to be able to resolve complex issues in, 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 individually. This is not working. So we have to work jointly. So I'm excited to be part of the journey uh, and particularly on pediatric cancer, pediatric in general, pediatric cancer. IMI, we have done a lot of work. There is one project called C4C. This is an infrastructure for clinical, very in, in, in clinical infrastructure for pediatric trial. This is not coming for, for, from nowhere. So we need to invest all the money, and it is an, an in depth work that we have to do to get the fruit. And this is the um, just in conclusion, IMI has invested a lot on different areas. I think the legacy of IMI is going to be big, and people have not really realized how much we have been doing. And again, so this is uh, great to be with you today, and I'm happy to really cover the uh, next PPP and how industry is going to join. Saladin, thank you very much for your comments. And Pablo. I'm responsible for uh, brain modulation within Medtronic. Um, well, today we are here because we are going to talk about brain tumors. Brain tumors are the second most common form of childhood cancer. So this is key, okay? So, I mean, we need to, uh, you know, uh, talk about these uh, brain tumors because there are a lot of burden around for the healthcare uh, system, but more, but more important for the patients and also for the families in this specific case. And also there is a room for improvement because there is a variability among treatment pathways in the different countries, and also the quality of care provided, uh, included by, the, by parents and families as also, is also different in the, in the different countries. So as a global organization, working with the stakeholders and professionals across the healthcare system, Medtronic is stepping forward to put 
the full power of our technologies, services, and also people that are inside this uh, corporation to work with new partners in new ways in this new, new area where that we are living because it's the only way, okay, to uh, close the gap and find solutions to all these challenges that we are facing. Pablo, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to all of the panel for their opening statements. I'd like to go back to Gilles, actually, because you're talking about now being the time to accelerate innovation for children and adolescents with cancer. Why now, Gilles? Well, for the very basic uh, reason. Each year, 35,000 young people are diagnosed with cancer. And 6,000 young people die each year of cancer, despite major progress over the last years. We need innovative treatments. We need innovative approach to cure more children and to cure them better. This is why in the cancer mission, one of the objectives of the number of deaths by cancer and of the burden. And this was mentioned by Irene, pediatric cancer is really part of the cancer mission that we hope will be developed and also the beating cancer plan. So yes, still a public issue. At the time, there is an explosion of, it, of understanding, understanding the biology and transforming this understanding into more effective treatments is really the time now. And we hope that all together we can really accelerate. I hope I answered the question, Matt. And Ruth, what, do you, what is your view on that? Why now? Should we not have had something earlier? Why are we only thinking about this and trying to push it so much now? Well, I think we just can take things as they are now, here. Now we have the opportunity to reframe the future. Children have been forgotten in the past for multiple reasons. Uh, the developments were not uh, modern. And I think children really deserve now the focus on their multiple needs. We have uh, uh, a lack of uh, development, uh, drug development in children specifically for their uh, respective age groups for the indications. And I may say for ages, uh, pediatricians are uh, used to work off label and nobody really uh, focuses that actually not focusing on children potentially means uh, to allow uh, that they uh, encounter harm because drug dosing is not right and appropriate for age and not appropriate for indication. And I think this cannot be overlooked any longer. So I, and they are waiting for us really to develop according to the need we would do for them as they are always close to our hearts. So, and the ambitions are really multifold. I mean, a private-public partnership are a unique opportunity to advance the field that has been in a silo in the past. So I'm really convinced that uh, the, we can roll out the arena of uh, uh, drug development needs, but also in developing new technologies uh, to increase uh, data sets, get out of the silos, really foster the research, yeah, break areas uh, that are currently out there. Um, push integration of health systems. And this is why I'm proud to be on the Cancer Mission Board, because I think a lot of these uh, activities only can be advanced together uh, in, in partnerships, also with uh, developments that we push uh, European Cancer Plan for the whole cancer community. But we must not forget that uh, children always need a very special attention uh, so that they are really... Um, seeing a better future and cures. Because cures that we, I mean, what the pediatric oncology has shown very nicely is, yes, we, can, we are networks, we can work together. Yeah, it's uh, many dec decades of clinical trials, but the cures today come at a high price with more than 60% of uh, growing late effect burdens. And children are desperate to get new drug innovations to really see better cures. So it's not only about curing more, it's really about curing better. Ruth, thank you very much for that. We've had a question come in, which I actually want to, uh, to put to Annette, oh. which is what kind of coordination would there be between Cluster Health, the IHI, and the Cancer Mission? Because I know, Annette, you're 
focus is very much redesigning the patient journey. So what sort of coordination do you think is required to do that? I think one of the opportunities that we have here is really to bring everybody to the table, all the stakeholders, so both the pharma sector, but also the patients, the clinicians, the researchers, and honestly, also the non-for-profits who bring I mean, if I look at the U.S., the budget of all the non-for-profits together is almost the same as the NIH budget. So I think we should just look at every partner who is out there and see what kind of value they bring to the table. And that is, I think, the way we can look at this. And I, I, what I, I love the, in a, the IMI, and I really also highly applaud that idea of the IHI, because now we will also be able to include wearables and devices and because I to the point why now for pediatric cancer I think the the big problem with pediatric cancer is pediatric cancer is very complex it's not just can I remove the tumor or can I shrink the tumor today is what is going to happen when these children that are treated with pretty nasty chemotherapies what is going to happen when they're 16 and 17 right so I think we really need to look at this in a in a very different way. So I think the only way to really break through and COVID has shown up that if we really work together, we can, we can so much, we can go so much faster. Right. So, and it's not easy. I think the, we have to really present incentives for people to come to the table. Why should I be there? Interesting uh, perspective there, Annette. Thank you very much indeed. Don't forget to put your questions in the chat box, either for an individual member of the panel or the panel in general, because we need your input and support into this debate. You're very much part of it. Um, Saladin, I wanted to come to you next um, to talk about the challenges, actually, of integrating it all, and particularly from the patient and carer perspective. Yes, thank you for the question. Yeah, the, the patient has to be central to um, all our effort. And uh, with IMI, we have launched a lot of programs around the patient, you know, patients in development, you know, what is the voice of the patient in the drug development? This is really innovating and it's kind of a disruptive approach. And IMI was really paving that road. So I have no doubt that in the next PPP, patient will be central. And uh, maybe, Maxine, I can just take the opportunity to link to the why now. As you and just want to, to share that innovation is happening as we as we speak now. Science has emerged, you know, much faster than we expected. I just want to give an example of CAR T. You know, this is so Novartis has been one of the company that has really paved the road in CAR T's. And there's a, we are curing patients with this approach. It's one of among others, and uh, but they are associated with. Uh, still add some more understanding. Cytokine release. So CAR T is just for, for, it's basically helping our immune system to fight against the tumor, using our own immune system to fight against the tumor. And this has proven to be extremely effective, but it's not easy. And we need the contribution of multiple people to go to the next level, basically expanding to solid tumors, Diagnostic, you know, avoiding, as I said earlier, side effects, etc. So there are a lot of things that we can improve for the patients, for the children particularly. So why now? Science is there, but you know, how do you adopt the science? How do you integrate it into um, into our healthcare system? It sometimes there's a disconnect. And if you ask people who are in this panel you know, about their exp experience, you know, about what happens to a patient when he goes to the hospital and when he or she is diagnosed, most of the time. They are going for the traditional approaches. So, who is getting, who is having access to the innovative approaches? That's what we can contribute for. Okay? And science is there. So, that's what I want to bring the message. Science is. Thank you very much. And it, there's a, a question that's coming about funding um, and particularly about the effect of the treatments perhaps being unaffordable for many parts of the EU. It's more of a statement than a question. It says, please do something about this. But funding is something that seems to be very much in the minds of our audience today. Has anyone got a comment on funding? Yes. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, okay. Gibbs. No, no, go, go ahead, Pablo. No, no, no. I mean, uh, I, I, I think uh, you got better experience than me on that. So go ahead, okay. please. Now, Maxine, uh, we need to keep yeah. in mind that at the moment, standard treatments can cure 80% of patients. 
with chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and surgery. And the key challenge is access across Europe for all children to be standard treatments. Innovation is up and running for those failing, and access to innovation is something that we need to address. And we start to see a few new drugs approved. Saladin was mentioning CAR T cell. We do have some recently approved medicine for children, which are now available or should be available with a high price and high cost. And this is why getting access to standard treatment for all children is an important goal that the European Reference Network on Pediatric Cancer is developing. And then we need to address now properly the new innovative compounds that will cure more children, introducing very early the connection with health technology assessment body. So regarding to treatment and cost and funding, clearly the funding of cure and treatment should be at the national level, but to cross border when needed to, to transfer patients. And we need to address innovation, not only in terms of science, but also anticipating how we get patient access to these expensive innovations. And just to follow up on that, could the use of big data sets and AI te technology improve development of the novel and effective diagnosis and treatment methods? A really good question there from the audience. Um, who would like to take that one? Put your hand up for me. Ruth. I can. Uh, yes, I may. Yes, please. But, uh, I think it's... Uh, I think there's a huge uh, op opportunity uh, in uh, the, the digital uh, revolution that we are currently uh, seeing. Because, yes, indeed, uh, we have uh, also in Europe still diagnostic silos, so that best diagnostics are not readily available at every place. And the more uh, we break uh, borders and silos and are able to digitalize and bring our systems to a level, uh, can be made easily accessible. And this is where ultimately also big data sets, new diagnostic means uh, driven by uh, artificial int intelligence, uh, frame a new future of diagnostics. And on top of this, uh, we want to have uh, better diagnostics also in the way uh, that we have uh, minimal invasive diagnostics. There's a lot of research ongoing in this field. And uh, with, uh, I'm just mentioning, for example, liquid, uh, liquid biopsies, uh, which uh, put away um, more invasive uh, diagnostics that we have to use currently to really follow up properly on a disease evolution from diagnosis and through our treatments and later on. So I think uh, through digitalization, integrative research and big data sets, I think it's a huge opportunity uh, to bring equity across Europe in terms of diagnostics. And ultimately, uh, I think it will uh, improve also our, it will help hopefully in this pathway also to um, make uh, the borders less uh, unsurmountable in cross-border collaborations. And which are our aims uh, in identified networks within uh, the European Reference Network. Okay, I just want to, we've got an interesting a follow up. Follow up on this. Yeah, Ruth, we've got a, a question that has come in for both you and, and Gilles about um, what would you do to overcome those national silos of data that you keep talking about? What can be done so that they, they are shared? Gilles, do you want to come in on that one? Uh, yes, uh, but in addition to um, access to the data, I would like to highlight that we need to reinvent the way we develop medicine for children with cancer because it's a rare condition, rare diseases, and we need to think about single arm trial. We need to think of using real world data really to put the evidence that we can generate for these rare patients. Mm -hmm. And in this, digitaliz digitalization is important. And this is why there are initiatives at the European level, you know, to aggregate database and make this available for researchers. And there will be some development, I hope, in the next years through programs to really make this big data generated from the hospital 
record the images, the pathology, and all the molecular sequencing really accessible in a way that can serve both industry development and research. So I'm well, confident about, that um, we can, you know, there is a solution. What about regulation, though? What about Sorry. the regulatory aspect of this? You want to talk about GDPR? No, regulate. Well, not necessarily GDPR, but that would come I'm into sorry, it. Well, and patient, patient privacy, yeah. But also different regulations in different yeah. areas. But we will deal with it. We will deal with it. We will make privacy and we will we will inform parents and patients about so, so people, what we... So people, uh, so people can they feel secure. They can feel secure with what's happening to their information. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But you know... When, when you have parents in your, in your office and you announce that uh, their child has a cancer, uh, of course, they want to, be, to know whether you can cure him or her. Of mm. course, they want to know why the child has cancer. And they are always very keen to really contribute, to make their child participate to clinical trials and to make things advance for research. It, it's, a, it, it's a community of, of, uh, of academics and the community of parents and patients, which are really willing to move the needle. So mm -hmm. this is an experience on the day to day. And being safe on the uh, privacy part will really make this available for innovation and a bit of care. Okay. Thank you. I, I think Maxine, that's this your is, room. This oh, oh Annette. Maxine? Yes, go yeah. ahead, Annette. So I think the, so we have we have been um, We've had experience with data sharing since 20, 2014. We started very careful with some data sharing. What we have seen is that people really came around the block. And I think it is a combination of policies and showing that there is an added value when you share your data. And I think those are two fantastic incentives for people to actually do share their data. The only thing, the only remark I wanted to make, and I was on an artificial intelligence panel about a month ago, is that there is really now maybe one worry is that we absolutely have to be sure that the data that we share is really quality data and that it's actually shareable because if we start to, for example, collect images on an MRI, but every MRI machine is different and these images are not in any way um, uh, usable as one integrated data set, you are in fact collecting data that later you won't be able to use. And then it becomes very disappointing and almost like an anti-incentive for people to share their data. So I think if you really do it well, you can get some great um, results out there. And, and it's really showing the value of, of sharing data, I think, is, is that, absolutely that, an incentive. For people. Just as you're talking there, actually, we had a question saying, how will the findings be disseminated and made understandable for patients? And I know that... For you, one of the main things is redesigning that patient journey. So how, how do you address that? So, as, so what we have been doing, and, and as you probably hear, I'm now a native English speaker. So I always consider that research and development is a language like any other language. So what we have really been doing is, is mapped, in fact, on what the UPATI initiative was at the European Commission, um, but a little bit of, uh, let's say, I always say it's a McDonald's version because I think the UPATI was very time consuming for patients. But just to be able to understand the R&D process and understand what you're looking at. And then, in fact, the patients really participate and understand and can play a role. It can be that stakeholder that is, in fact, an integrated part of the whole ecosystem. So we have yeah. been very focused on education at the foundation because we think that's really key for patients to be able to understand Okay. okay. Um, Ruth, did you want to have a very quick comment on that, or are you okay? Very briefly, if you could. Uh, I just wanted to comment, uh, underpin, just to underpin uh, that uh, to the means of record linkage. So I think just to take away this uh, this worry uh, at large. And uh, I think it's also to, important to underpin when we as, uh, when we gather uh, data, we need uh, to have uh, obviously quality uh, data. And our experience from the community, cancer community, pediatric community, is that they are more than willing uh, to share the data 
because they see the, the benefits and it is also giving back to the society and help uh, help others for a better cure. So there's a lot of motivation from the patient side. And I think it's our responsibility from the view of regulators, member states, uh, to, um, to buy into this process and not to build hurdles where patients actually are very willing to give and share. Okay, thank you. Uh, just, Pablo, can, can I, I bring you in? I'm sorry, who wanted to speak? Can I, can I build on that? Just yes, please, please, please. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to build on that and say that we are not starting from, from nowhere here uh, about sharing. And there's a, there's a legitimate uh, concern, right, about uh, data privacy. However, as was mentioned uh, by Ruth and, 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 and Jill and Annette, we, we are already doing it. And I can refer to multiple IMI projects where we it, this is applied and there's no problem. So there's a lot of fear, which is legitimate. And uh, just to reassure everyone, we can do it. We can share and we can guarantee the best use of the data for the benefit of the patients. And I can uh, give you some examples like Eden, which is one of the great examples of data, decentralized data, where you can let the data where they are. They are sitting where they are supposed to be and they are connected, you know, that's the... That's the beauty. But I think Annette mentioned it, and um, and Jai uh, This is about the quality of the data. So we, we you have when you work on data, you need to make sure that they are curated and they are useful in the best way. And this is where the partnership could help. Jointly identifying the standards, what you can do the best out, out of the data, and make sure that they are transparent. And, and again, just to ensure everyone, we have experience with that with IMI, and we can do better in the future. Okay, and I just want to bring Pablo in yes, on that. Yes, but there is only one pediatric cancer oh, IMI know, project so far. Okay, Jill, one second. Pablo, do you want to come in on this as well? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, that, that's that's the key. I mean, I think all the all my colleagues have already uh, touched base, I mean, on all this uh, discussion, but basically this is it, okay? I think that in this uh, disease in particular, okay, we need to uh, leverage some data Okay, that at the end will support the, you know, the, the use of different treatment options. And for that, we need a collaborative uh, way of, of doing. Otherwise, I mean, we will not um, move the, the needle, okay? And, uh, and this is the case because, I mean, obviously, uh, we are talking about different kind of uh, brain tumors, I mean, that are all are not uh, the same. And also, obviously, because uh, we need somehow to find a way in order to share, share all this knowledge. OK, so this knowledge and, and we are, don't get me wrong, I mean, we have uh, I've got previous experience on, on different um, ways of sharing this data that at the end uh, we succeed, I mean, on, on uh, well, uh, I mean, developing a good uh, uh, treatment uh, uh, pathway, uh, treatment options, I mean, and in order to guide all the uh, community on the best options available, okay, uh, that could be, don't get me wrong, uh, drugs or, or surgical procedures. So at the end, I mean, this is, I think, the aim for all the, well, all the community that are uh, working on, on, on this disease. We're talking about um, paediatric cancer here in this panel as a test case. Um, that's what we're discussing about integrating health research and innovation. Is it a good example? Is the integration to a point where it's a good example? Pablo, do you want to follow yes. up with that? Then we'll get some more panel members. <laughs> if Jill said yes, I said yes. No, obviously, yes. I mean, it is. Okay, yeah. Uh, obviously, the... I mean, there are challenges, I mean, as, as always, okay? And, and in particular here, because we are talking about, you know, don't get me wrong, but uh, kids, we are talking about cancer. I think that we have two key, th two key areas in order to push for uh, getting this innovation, okay? Uh, because obviously what everything that, that is related to a cancer and, and kids, I think that, well, I think that we, we, we can use this momentum, I mean, or the, or the, the, this, uh, well, call it tailwheel, I mean, in order to move forward and convince that there is a, a, a morbid mortality, I mean, around that uh, need to take, I mean, a, a, and have this special focus, okay? So I, I really think that, well, basically when, when we have um, talked to different stakeholders in order, you know, to put the focus on this area, they all understand that, uh, well, they, this is not something else, okay? This is a, an area where, I mean, a lot of innovation is needed 
and because there is room for improvement. Don't get me wrong. I think we have already talked about this variability among the, the treatments. We have talked about also about the quality of care that could be also, uh, uh, well, I mean, enhanced. Uh, and this is why, okay, we are, uh, well, based on our experience, moving forward to what is a specific treatment that is given, I mean, in, a, in an OR, in, a, in a, a surgical procedure, to see what has happened previously and we, what will happen later on, okay? So moving, I mean, uh, analyzing what is the current referral, for example, outside the hospital, what is happening, I mean, inside the hospital, and what, what will happen to the patient and their families later on, okay? Because the innovation is not only about uh, treatment options, okay? It's, uh, about all the uh, well, the patient pathway that we have talked about previously. Yeah, and it's an interesting point, isn't it? Because what about innovative solutions for the long-term follow-up of children, including that quality data that we were hearing about there, and, and bridging that between uh, pediatric oncology and adult oncology? Who would like to take that? Who would like to follow up on that? Gilles? Gilles? Um, First, on your previous question, is mm. care and research integrated in pediatric cancer? The answer is yes. More than 50% of newly diagnosed patients with cancer, children and adolescents, are participating at diagnosis to prospective clinical trials, raising the question of improving the outcomes. And less than 5% are participating so far to industry trial. This is academic research. This is a community which has been integrating care and research daily for the last 50 years. So yes, integration of both is there. Second, you are addressing the long-term follow-up. This is a, a crucial point. The community is looking at the adult surviving of childhood cancer, and there are large programs in Europe, in the US, really addressing this population, trying to understand the long-term complications, side effects, and trying to empower the patients receiving this treatment in their infancy. And this is really one of the important activities daily in the practice of uh, uh, childhood cancer uh, services and so on. But this is a point where we need to have some public private partnership because we have now brand new, top, brand new compounds. We don't know what will be in the next years. And the companies do have some requests by the authorities to follow this patient receiving the new treatments over time. On the other hand, we do have the academic uh, um, teams really engage with the parents and patient to look at this. And I think it's a perfect proposal for a public-private partnership to build a platform that will generate the needed information for this patient using the brand new innovation over the next years. And this could be really important to push the concept of survivorship, to push the concept of quality by generating the information needed for pharmaceutical companies, putting on the markets drug for pediatric cancer. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, no, no, that's fine. Ruth, could I bring you in on that? And I'll come to you in a second, Pablo. Um, yes, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Just uh, underpinning what uh, she uh, just said, obviously, but uh, also to enlarge a little bit uh, the scope, uh, the uh, the concept of a survivorship passport was really coming from the survivors themselves in the community. And ever since then, we have developed uh, this idea step by step and it needs uh, further development. And it has raised uh, interest also within the adult oncology world that we uh, address uh, a healthcare passport for uh, patients uh, with cancer and after cancer. And this means that we uh, uh, transport condensed uh, on the point information on treatment, treatment burden, uh, also propose uh, solutions, yeah, what to expect, and really to inform health systems as the patient goes back to a normal life. Uh, and wishes to live a normal life, you need to inform all the stakeholders uh, in the health uh, sector where the patient might go in the future. So I think this is a huge idea and concept that we have uh, here, really uh, a platform, a forum for long-term follow-up coverage.
covering all the needs uh, when the story goes uh, on uh, the first extensive treatment and we face long-term follow-ups with these multiple needs, which are psychosocial, which are also obviously very concrete uh, organ-related uh, long-term side effects, multiple needs uh, to be addressed. And here we need really interactive uh, healthcare systems and uh, good information that can travel across and we will learn as we go through big databases uh, through a concept that we previously addressed. Okay, thank you. Pablo, you wanted to come in there as well, didn't you? I mean, uh, because um, especially in France, I mean, the, and because um, well, I think Gilles, you, you are based there. I mean, the, uh, we have developed different, I mean, national registry, I mean, that are supported. I mean, when the, we are launching a new device or, or a new technology, sometimes, I mean, it's, uh, it's good to develop these uh, national registries just to, I mean, uh, demonstrate, I mean, what has been shown in previous uh, clinical trials, I mean, that had support, I mean, the launch of, an, of a new technology. So I think it's a good way also, I mean, to, to find these uh, partnerships that we are talking about today, okay, uh, in order to, well, help in funding this type of initiative, in order to help these starting ages, I mean, uh, or starting uh, um, stages of a new technology, okay, and helping also the leveraging I mean, data on a clinical practice, okay, meaning uh, out of these, uh, you know, ideal conditions that are, are um, uh, well, happening in a, in a clinical trial. I want to ask um, so, the panel um, as a whole, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask the panel as a whole is, where are the gaps? I'll come around you individually. Where, where do you think the gaps are that need to be filled? The challenges that have not yet been addressed. And uh, Annette, can I come to you first? Just briefly, if you can. Yeah, sure. No, I'm, I think what Ruth brought up in the beginning in her opening statement that children are not small adults is I think there is still some biology missing to really understand the difference between pediatric cancer and adult cancer. So I think there is maybe still some investments in the biology that will be needed. I think mm. the, um, the thing at my plea is, can we avoid cancer, right? Is there anything preventive that we can do? And in our community, we're studying these children with what they call benign cancers. Can we avoid that these, ter these tumors turn malignant? Can we avoid cancer? And maybe the, the other thing is, um, I think especially in the pediatric cancer field, which I always compare to the orphan um, drug field, is there is really going to be a need to globally come together. Um, so there's going to be a need for global collaborations and alignment on care and, uh, and, and all the things we've been talking about, right? Like data sharing and all these kind of things. So I think there's still a couple of um, things to be figured out here, but... Um, I think there is a lot of hope and opportunities. Sheila, what, what, where would you see the, the gaps, the challenges, what needs, to, what needs to be done to fill those areas? Well, you know, Maxim, this morning, Pierre Merlin, in his uh, introductory talk, said that IMI2 was a powerful partnering machine, not for everything. And I think the discussion we had at the moment is very important because we see the global needs for pediatric cancer to improve cancer care, to improve innovation and so on. But I think we should focus on the needs that can be addressed by IMI and private partnership, really to push innovation because it is at the moment what we need. We have science, we have patients' needs, we have regulation that will be changing. And we need to have instruments to really push forward. So what are the gaps? I come to your question. The gaps is long-term follow-up. On one hand, you have pharma who are asked to really generate on the long-term data from the patient. They cannot do. And on the other hand, there are community looking at their patient with a survivorship passport and other initiative for years. Connecting to generate for the sake of patient and the needs of the pharma. Second, mm -hmm. Repurposing. There are many drugs shelved on the shelves of the uh, pharma, including in adults. And it's extremely difficult from <coughs> really have this developed children, whether they're rational, to have access to that. 
Can we think about something to facilitate science-driven repurposing? Third, I mentioned that so far, the HTA are still looking at new drugs in a comparative way. We cannot do this comparison in pediatric cancers, in other rare disease. How can we innovate in the design, in the implementation with the platform and real-world data? This is a gap. And, uh, and Saladin was really sharing with us how these big data have been addressed before in the IMI2. Oh, there was only one project on pediatric cancer in IMI2. This is a time for more and for addressing the gaps in the new setting of cancer mission and BT cancer plan. And let's speak Two to ideas. Saladin. Thank you. Let's speak to Saladin next. Saladin, where, where do you see the gaps or maybe we should call them opportunities for more to be done? Yes. Yeah, not, not to add to what was said, and Jean, I agree with you. Uh, not enough in the IMI on the pediatric cancer, definitely. Uh, there are so many diseases, so we, we, we try to do as much as we could, but still, there's an opportunity now to, to use it to, to go for pediatric cancer. So to, to just to add an, another perspective, you know, long-term survival was mentioned. I, I'd like to, to bring another concept, which is more on the um, early intervention. So a better understanding of the disease and early intervention has the highest chance of cure. And that's not something that would be easy to do. So even if you identify some markers, you know, markers, you know, or better understanding. So how do you integrate that with the regulator, with the payers, you know? This is what we call, you know, the... Uh, this is interception, is a concept that is interesting, not only in, we talk about it in type 1 diabetes and in other diseases, why not in pediatric cancer? Okay, you know, I would just uh, put that as a one, one, so one sort and say, bringing all the data together. And that would help, you know, combine devices, new technologies, you know, that would be helping us, you know, to, um, to integrate all of the, those information. So for me, local survival is the late phase. I would really engage some conversations about how can we bring large sets of data together with longitudinal studies to really better understand the progress of the development and the progress of the disease to have an earlier intervention that will have a better chance for cure. Thank you very much. Pablo, what are your thoughts on where the gaps are, what needs to be done? Basically, uh, uh, talking about pediatric cancer, I mean, is for me, key thing is that first, I mean, not seeing this as another cancer or, or linking it with adult cancer. I mean, this is something completely different. Uh, second is uh, just, I mean, overcoming, I mean, this all these hurdles that we have already identified. For me, is key. I mean, the, the well, the lack of patience or lack of a uh, uh, good uh, way of uh, developing, I mean, or testing these new drugs, new, new technologies in order to, uh, well, developing good guidelines, good uh, uh, cl uh, clinical recommendations, I mean, to handle this type of patient. And I'm going to bring something, well, new that we have not touched base, I mean, today, but uh, uh, for these patients, I mean, we, we need to think also about their families. Uh, obviously, kids, I mean, uh, need to go to the hospital with, uh, with their, well, mother, uh, with their parents, I mean, uh, or the, the father, I mean, I don't care. I mean, the, 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 what is uh, crucial is that obviously there is uh, an impact on their families, okay? So there are some projects that we, well, we've been studying, I mean, about the accommodation of all these uh, fami families, I mean, that are going, I mean, from, uh, abroad or going, I mean, from outside the cities, I mean, to, to hospitals to receive the, uh, an appropriate uh, treatment uh, or, or an appropriate care of the, uh, of the disease that the, the kid is suffering from. And uh, well, it, this is another, obviously, area to be explored, but we need to also think about the burden, not only for the patients, but also for the families, because this is also huge. <clears throat> Pablo, thank you very much. And finally, Ruth, where do you see the gaps? Um, I try to be not repetitive and just close some gaps because lots of points, important points were already made. Uh, I think we should probably should also uh, think about the topic, uh, the uh, Embrema uh, working group recently uh, yeah, summarized and addressed, and this is preparedness uh, for uh, clinical trials in drug development. I think we are not uh, yet to the point to act uh, uh, properly in the field of, uh, of rare diseases. I think C4C is a, is a huge opportunity to 
uh, we organize the European landscape. And uh, if I may be provocative, I think uh, in this uh, arena, we should have means uh, to prepare better with the experts early on prior prior to PIPs exactly what is needed for ADC so that we don't struggle uh, on, on requirements uh, that don't serve uh, the needs uh, ultimately, plus uh, that uh, we really uh, um, have a possibility of an ad hoc uh, trial inclusion, so shorten the deadline, think about new concepts so that we don't wait time and money in huge trials uh, where then recruitment is not okay. So I think we need to have new innovative thinking to speed up uh, this process, uh, all these different steps uh, that we have. And uh, coming back a little bit to early and uh, interventions, yeah, as much as we know from adult cancer, where cancer often is uh, the outcome of uh, exposure, of lifelong exposure to various uh, toxins uh, uh, and previous. Um, this is not the case uh, in, in children. And we have here uh, definitely a focus on one hand on a predisposition where early early screening, early detection, uh, genomic risk scores uh, could be of value to really uh, understand uh, this uh, predisposition syndromes better and uh, this is a way of prevention um, that, that could help to drive um, here for, for a certain okay. community. Uh, of uh, affected families, uh, the future towards the better. So this is uh, a little bit to, to build on what the speakers previously said. And uh, just to underpin, uh, I think working with the uh, HDAs uh, early on and to have really integrative uh, developments from preparedness uh, to really bring it to, uh, finally to those the drugs who need them, bring them really bedside and have them really approved in the in the health systems. I think okay. this needs to be much more interactive and that could help to close a lot of gaps that we are currently facing, which is extremely time and cost intensive. Okay, Ruth, thank you very much indeed for that. Very comprehensive and to the rest of the panel as well. A very comprehensive uh, view there. Um, from around the table of where the gaps are. Now, we have been getting quite a lot of questions in. And to you, the audience, please keep them coming because this is your moment when I will put your questions, as many as we can, to the panel. Um, now, this one is from the patient advocate, Chris Copeland. And he's saying, incentives for pediatric drug development have been based on patient extensions and thus price inflation. Does the Horizon Cancer Mission offer the opportunity to completely reset how we encourage innovation. Who would like to take that question? It's an interesting one, isn't it? Gilles? Um, to... Well, I'm sorry, but I, I did take only part of the of the question from Chris would Copeland. I, do you want me to repeat it for you? In yes, centers, please. Sorry. Yes. In, in, no, no, no worries. Incentives for pediatric drug development have been based on patient extensions and thus price inflation. Does the Horizon Cancer Mission offer the opportunity to completely reset how we encourage innovation? Uh, so I think there are two things uh, what I hear from this question is on one hand, there is the pediatric regulation that put incentives, and how can we see better tailored incentives in the probable revision ahead for developing and accelerating innovation for children with cancer? Because the uh, six months extension at the end of the life of the drug uh, protected um, did not prove to be efficient in incentivizing drug development for pediatric cancer on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, uh, within the cancer mission and the Horizon Europe, I think there will be something extremely important. What will be the public investment in the field of developing innovative medicine for children with cancer? I think for the first regulation, the only investment from Europe was on 
on off-patent medicine, the pediatric use marketing authorization. This was only the funding from Europe to really incentivize uh, improving uh, off-patent medicine for children on the whole, and it failed. And I think this is an important point made by uh, Jean-Éric Jean, Jean Paquet this morning and made also by a, a recent report from the European Commission. It should not be only on the shoulder of pharma to develop innovation for children with cancer, rare disease, life-threatening disease. So clearly, we would very much like to see within the horizon Europe with omission cancer, public investment to really push the innovation and incentivize small companies, biotechs, working with academy to develop specific medicine children, for children that will be uh, effective. So this is how I try to address the comment by Chris about incentive and horizon Europe. But happy to let my colleagues to uh, address this further on. Would anyone else like to come in on that question? Annette, do you want to say something? Or are you OK? I, I have to admit that I'm not that of an expert yet in the horizon. We just launched ETF Europe 18 months ago. So I'm I'm not the perfect person to, <laughs> although okay. I completely endorse the idea that create incentive. Let's let's move on to the next question because I would I would like to try and get oh Ruth sorry if you want to oh okay we're all, we're all coming in Ruth a very short answer if you could please so we can get as many as we can. Uh, very just very short uh, just to say that uh, the Horizon Europe program is in the building phase so uh, one cannot give a definite answer but if one reads to the cancer mission uh, you, you would see the strong push to, to innovation uh, to develop and understand uh, uh, cancer better so I think it's all the opportunity is all in there to develop a program that pushes exactly towards these needs that are addressed. Thank you very much. Saladin, did you want to mention? Just yeah. Just, yeah, just a, a brief one. I think we could debate about uh, the, I think incentives are critical, you know, for, for uh, to push, to move things, to move the needle. Without incentives, not much is going to move. And I, and I would agree that we, we need to have complementary um, uh, activities to add on. The opportunity for the next PPP is an opportunity for us to address more pediatric and, and pilot and try your new approaches. And as we said earlier, we have not done probably enough on the IMI side of pediatric cancer, right? So let's try it, let's pilot it. And I would really invite, you know, all the players, you know, to join debate, you know, and say, let's come with proposals. And we heard some today, right? You know, and so, so we're happy to consider that. But for me, why I'm saying that, it's not just for the sake of saying we need to do something. I'm just sometimes concerned that when we do an initiative that is public only or industry only or uh, you name it, you know, in isolation, I, I'm skeptical. I think here we really need to have um, activities that are integrated. We need to have all the players around the table. It's complex. It's not something that is easy. But we have experience. We have the latest IMI. Let's, let's continue on that, on that side because in isolation, we may address one element, one element. So let's try to join to do it and the next PPP is an open. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the next question, and this is an interesting one. Is there a plan to use pediatric cancer as proof of concept for the creation of a European genomic database? Interesting question. Anyone got a thought on that? Can you repeat the question? Uh, question, the question is, Could yes, you repeat the question, the question, please? of course, the question is, is there a plan to use pediatric cancer as proof of concept for the creation of a European genomic database? I can answer. I don't know. <laughs> There's your answer. Thank you very much. But it is an interesting thought that has come through. Uh, we've also had a few questions on European reference networks. And it's uh, this one is, hang on one sec, it's just disappeared. I shall get it back. Here we are. Um, it says, uh, as most pediatric cancers are relatively rare, 
the role of networking amongst children's hospitals to generate knowledge, shared data platforms, and hubs to implement innovation is necessary in support of the ERN. Could the IMI or IHI contemplate to finance a project that would be twinned with the ERNs in order to build on Europe's academic excellence? Is this a good thought? I think it would be an excellent idea to build something together because I think one of the um, enormous opportunities to get all that data sharing across the ERNs is exactly that you create that necessary critical data and set to do something really transformative. What is sometimes lacking is the funding to really maintain the ERNs from going. So I think it's an excellent idea. Uh, and the follow-up to that is the uh, how will ERNs connect? Sorry, who wanted to come in there? Did someone want to come in? Sorry. Yeah, this is, this is where public product partnership can make a difference. That's where we we are connecting, you know, engaging in networks. This is this is where we have demonstrated the value, and um, I think this is a great question, and uh, I, think I will fully support uh, the proposal. There's a follow-up in within the question asking how will ERNs connect with developers, and can there be PPPs involved in that? Again. Um, uh, Ruth, I Ruth. can can take this one uh, very quickly. Uh, I think uh, ends have come away, and uh, it's understood now that uh, research is an extremely important com component uh, to really integrate EAN in pre-existing infrastructures. But I think uh, research infrastructures. But I think it's not only this. This is exactly where there is a role for public partnerships because ultimately it's about uh, understand to develop and uh, bring uh, bring cures and means uh, to the patient yeah and this is well mm -hmm. for pediatric cancer as well for the ERNs so yes there, there's um there have been quite a number of questions um and Gilles you will probably come back in on this I would think and it's back to privacy again and I'll just run through a few of them for you. They're coming from both sides of the debate. Uh, patients' biggest barrier is that of their privacy. How can you ensure that confidence is improved? The next one. My experience is that privacy is less of an issue for patients than for other stakeholders when it's a question of getting help with their serious illness. And the third one again, a main issue is that patients, people, should be the full and only owners of their data. And this isn't really the case in reality. How important is it that there is some system whereby the patients feel confident in their privacy, but also that their information can be used for the greater good? Gilles, do you want to come back in on that? I know you were interested in GDPR. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, I was saying the big world that was behind <laughs> the only yeah. thing. Um, yeah. No, all these points are extremely valuable. Um, we have a, a, a legal framework now in Europe. Uh, we have already identified that this framework in some area of research is a, is a bit of a constraint. And we need to build our initiative to uh, um, uh, respect privacy, to make uh, uh, parents and patients informed um, and, and the capacity to say no, and the capacity also to know what we are doing with the data that we are collecting. Um, but these points are valid points, and, and I think, and I'm sure that when we are building that, we will take into account these uh, this, this, this things, and also have parents and patients with us working. And this is very important. In pediatric oncology, we are working with the parents, with the patients, with the survivors. You will say up Europe, the Memorandum of Understanding, with CCI Europe, which is a federation of patient uh, organizations across Europe. And we are working together. And not only to say, well, we need more, better treatment for children. We are working on solutions. And we are building this. They will be on board to really give the voice of the patient of the parents, of the citizens, and assure that what we are doing is okay. Who 
who else would like to take that one? Pablo. And on, on this regard, also, there are two. Okay? The, there are, well, patients and families could sign a, a consent form, okay? Obviously, covering all the legal things. Uh, and also, they they will have the rights, I mean, to, uh, well, later on, resign or, or just jump, jump out, okay, uh, from the for having shared the data, but there are other things, okay? Obviously, the data will could be uh, anonymized, uh, meaning that uh, it will be no link to any patient name or or, or uh, that you cannot follow all the information or link all the, all the medical information to a, a, a specific patient. Because at, at the end, I think what we are looking for is for aggregated data, okay? In order to see whether or not, okay, different treatment options, different amino alternatives, are working well, better or worse, uh, and, and in order to take decisions on that, on that regard. But I think, based on all the the well specificities that we have discussed today, this type of aggregation is needed in order to uh, you know uh, have a greater sample in order to take decisions. Pablo, thank you very much. So, um, can, yes, Maxime, can yeah. I comment on this because this is now, in fact, talking to the patients. Um, so we have had extensive discussion with our patients about privacy. And I think the three main problems that people have is that one, they don't understand the consent they're signing because it's written in a way that people don't understand. The second thing is that but when privacy really becomes a challenge is that they don't know which data has been shared because they, have se they haven't seen the data sometimes themselves. And they also don't know exactly what will be done with that data. So I think if we can comfort our patients that we will not share their data with the wrong people. Um, what we have seen is that our patients are extremely happy to share their data because they say, even if it doesn't help me, it may help somebody else with our conditions. So as long as I think we make our patients owner of their own data, I don't feel that our patients have a challenge with sharing it. It's just that there is this whole fog around that people just don't understand what they're signing and they don't understand what they're signing up for. But I think okay. if you um, make them sure that they understand what they're signing up for, then patients are absolutely willing to share their data. Thank you very much. Um, now we're racing towards, I'm sorry, Ruth, but point, we're racing, if I could, no, no, we're racing towards the end of the uh, yeah. session. And I, I would like you all to have one final thought uh, around the table before we go. We could go on with the questions, I think, for most of the day. I think we've had a flavor of what people are thinking. So if you could really in one sentence only, a very short thought, because we don't have much time. Um, just just tell me your thoughts now. What Are you optimistic for the future or if you've got a pertinent thing that you want to say. Ruth. Um, I, I am optimistic for the future and I think uh, with uh, this uh, innovative uh, feelings across the whole stakeholder community of uh, sharing not only data but high level communications, corporations, co-design, co-creation, uh, we are able to frame a new future. Thank you very much. Gilles. Yeah, thanks, Maxine. I am definitely optimistic because Accelerate demonstrated that the value of working together, industry, regulators, parents, and academia. I am I too demonstrated the value of having public private partnership with ITCC before. And clearly, we identify gaps and opportunities that can be really addressed in the future by IMI2 projects. Thank you very much. Annette. I'm going to throw a little thing out there. What I would love to do is to come back to Gilles' idea about drug repurposing and getting shelf drugs off um, out of pharma companies. And I would like to launch an invitation. Can we develop a pilot? Can we develop a framework to access shelf assays and incentivize companies to release them? And if you're interested, contact me. We'd love to <laughs> throwing, throwing down the gauntlet there, Annette. Thank you very much. Saladin. Yeah, I'm definitely optimistic. Uh, knowing what, what we have done, those are concrete deliverables from the IMI. I, I can just tell you that the preparation for the next uh, public private partnership across the different sectors, industry, from the industry side, I've seen the energy from the different uh, sectors that we have not been used to talk to each other. 
the energy, the positive energy there is just exciting. So we are ready. We are prepared. So we are now discussing with the Commission to launch it. So definitely optimistic. And and at your suggestion, Gilles, Pablo, and Ruth, so please join us, you know, and making this really a success for the future. Happy to do Saturday, so. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Big thumbs up there. Pablo, a final thought from you. Well, obviously, I mean, I'm also optimistic, I mean, because we are changing our approach from uh, an episode of care, okay, uh, to uh, a more holistic approach that would fulfill patients and families' needs, okay? On, on this regard, obviously, uh, we, I mean, are part of, of this, I mean, in order to make it happen, but we are not the only ones, okay? So we are open, okay, to uh, well, uh, getting this new approach. But in conjunction with the clinicians, in conjunction with, uh, I mean, uh, all together with also the uh, the administration, in order to make things happen. That at the at the end, based on the, uh, today's discussion, uh, we need to uh, move the needle. So this is it. Pablo, thank you very much. Um, we've had a very interesting discussion, and I just want to pull out a few points about it. We're talking about words such as cure more, cure better, from Ruth. From Gilles, now is the time to accelerate innovation for children and adolescents with cancer. From Annette, redesigning that patient journey. From Saladin, take the patient and carer perspective as the starting point. And Pablo, pediatric cancer integrated care solutions along with the healthcare continuum. I hope you've enjoyed our panel. I want to thank all of our panelists for taking part and all of you for giving us your questions.